Into the Word. Y'all ready to get into the Word? Okay, so if you have your, your onion skin Bible, your, your on and on skins, right? The, the ones where the, the battery never goes out. Grab that and open up to the book of Acts. We're going to go chapter 1. The book of Acts chapter 1. And I may take some rabbit trails in here, so you got to bear with me a little bit. Uh, I want to come to you today from an aspect of teaching. Uh, I was actually scheduled to preach on July 2nd and Pastor Joey and I were asked to switch because he gets to launch the new series and so yeah I don't know if you know how it is like when you prepare for something you're like okay I'm excited to do that and then things get switched up and you're like okay now what and I'm like okay God what, what is it that you need me to do and I was actually encouraged because Pastor Joey and I were talking uh, backstage a, a little while ago and he was telling me what he's going to be preaching on on July 2nd to kick off this new series. And I'm like, man, that sounds like a fun one. I can't wait for that one. And I, I thank God for what he downloaded me for you today. Now, I'm going to pray in a minute that you forget everything I say. But you never forget what God speaks. Because it's not about the person with the microphone up here. It's really about God speaking to you and how God can use you in this world. And so we're here in this series, Upper Room. We get to close this out today. Today's the finale of it, and I am privileged and honored to be able to share the word with you. I want to break it down and make it simple. Can we do that? Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 8, and this, or 6 through 8, this is what it says. In the New Living Translation, there's another translation that you're going to hear later on. It's the RJV version. The RJV version. That's the Richard Jason Villafana version. That's how I interpret things. It's not a, it's a dynamic translation. It's not a, a, a literal translation, but we'll get to that in a minute. In the NLT, this is what it says. So the apostles were with Jesus and they kept asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know what that's like. Can you imagine how Jesus felt? They kept asking, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Let me help you understand what's happening. These guys have been walking around with Jesus for three and a half years. They do not have the New Testament. They have some of the prophets. They have the Torah. They have the first five books of the Bible. And in the first five books of the Bible, it has been taught over and over to them how the Messiah is going to come. It was not supposed to be in their mind in a manger. Certainly not by a 15-year-old unwed girl and certainly not to a carpenter named Joseph. So in the Jewish mind, they're still waiting for their Messiah to come, not realizing that he's already come. And so the disciples, the apostles, they're there with Jesus, and they're asking, okay, is this the day? I mean, is this the day when you, like, you know, you get your, like, Hulk Hogan on, or what is it, the Incredible Hulk, and you start smashing Romans? Is today the day? They're excited. They want Jesus to come in like Superman and just wipe everything out in the natural. Not realizing that Jesus did everything like that in the spiritual realm. So they're still questioning. And here's Jesus, his response. The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. It'll happen. Someday it will happen. But I don't want to live in someday, I want to live in today. Verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling the people everywhere. Telling the people about me everywhere. Okay, Pastor Toby and Pastor Glenn did a phenomenal job opening the series. Pastor Glenn did two sermons that were just bar none. I mean, it was crazy. My, my, my particular favorite portion was when we did the, the Lord's Prayer, and he brought such an eloquent understanding to how it must have sounded when everybody was listening to, to these guys get filled and these ladies get filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said the Lord's Prayer in their, in their native tongue, and it sounded just like tongues that we speak here in church. <clears throat> and then Pastor Toby came in, and he talked about the importance of, of how unity, it, it, God needs unity in order for, for him to move in the people. And I, I like to say it this way, uh, I can be in unity with you and not necessarily agree with what we're doing. Let me say that again. I can be in unity and not necessarily agree with what we're doing. I played football for almost 16 years of my life. And there are plays that our coach would call that I'm like, that's not gonna work. That is not gonna work. But I didn't stand there and do nothing. 
I actually ran the play. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But what we did is we got back in the huddle in unity, and we talked about the next play. We brushed off the past that's behind us, whether it was good or bad, and now we're going into the next play in unity. Well, in the natural mirrors of spiritual, you and I can be in unity and not necessarily agree. Because if you have ever watched the show Chosen, I love the depiction of how the disciples act when Jesus isn't there. They, these guys are fussing, arguing, and fighting, and, and you know, they, they got feelings, and, and Jesus shows up, they're like, oh, everything's perfect. We're all in unity. All harmony here, Jesus. No, no division at all. But that's the church, is it not? Okay, <clears throat> so we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What we didn't cover in chapter 2, I'll give you a little synopsis. Peter, after being baptized with the Holy Spirit, goes and he preaches this firestorm message. I mean, it's like people are getting, 3,000 people got saved. Here's what happened in the church that you may have missed. In chapter 2 and verse 44, it's not on the screens, I'm just giving you a synopsis of it. It says that they met together in one place, what we're doing right now. They sold their properties and their possessions to help those in needs. We do that all the time. And verse 46 tells us that the church went together and worshiped together and they started home groups. We do that all the time here. In verse 47, let, uh, let, let us know that, that, that they worshiped together, they gathered in groups, and the Lord added to the church daily. You know, one of the things that I love about our church is that we add to the church daily. We get to be the church. Here's the RJV version of what's happening. Get to church. That's good. If you're online and you can't get here, God bless you. But if you have the ability to be here in the building, what you missed in the building for worship at the 11 o'clock, golly, power, anointing. I don't know if you felt it through the screen, if the anointing was that strong and you felt it, praise God. But if you can, we should be in the church. We should get together. We, we, we are a generous church. Generosity is our job. We love to give. It's not something that we have to do. It's something we get to do. Uh, for those of you that are wondering, you know, we see results every single week of salvations that happen at this altar. We, we, we impact our community every single day. It's not just on Sunday where we're seeing lives change. We see lives change on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're doing door to door. People are coming on the grounds, getting saved. People are going out and getting saved. I mean, we, we do a lot of the work of the ministry right here in the house. This is good soil. This is a book of Acts type church. I'm excited about who we are as a church because here's what I know about this house. This house is a house of prayer. I'm going to try over here. This house is a house of prayer. I'll, I'll give you another opportunity. This house is a house of worship. We love seeing people get saved in this house. So I'm a proud citizen of heaven, but I'm also a proud congregant member of the house, Modesto. So now let's jump into Acts chapter 3. After all that happened, 3,000 people get saved. The Holy Spirit's moving. God's adding to the church daily. They're just turning the whole world upside down in a matter of moments. Acts chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. Let me set the story up for you real quick. John and Peter are going to church, and there's a guy that they set at the gate called Beautiful every day. And this guy is crippled. The Bible says that he's lame, he can't walk, and he's begging for money. Alms for the poor, alms for the poor. Every day he's out there begging, and Peter walks up to him, and this is what he says. This is what recently baptized in the Holy Spirit, saved Peter says. I ain't got nothing for you. I have no money. I have, he says, I don't have any silver or gold for you. But what I do have, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand, not the wrong hand, the right hand, and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and his ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped to his feet. He stood on his feet. He began to walk, then walking, then leaping and praising God. He went into the temple with them. Here's the title of my message. Get up and walk. Get up and walk. Elbow your neighbor and say, get up and walk. 
It's time to get up and walk. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this house. God, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing through this team, through this congregation. Lord, I pray that as you give me the wisdom beyond my years to speak today, that I would not do your word any harm. I pray, God, that you would speak through me in a way that would be simple to understand and easy to accomplish. Help me today to speak your word. Let them forget every word that is from me, but not a single word that you speak through me. And I ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me tell you about my worship experience. I think I shared this a little bit before. The men have heard this if you came to the H group or H class. Um, they had this thing. Thank you. The music stopped. I love you. Appreciate you. I could just stop. It was so beautiful. <clears throat> there was a there was this thing we did called the Crest. It was a men's event that we did too. And, uh, you know, it was really cool. And at the time in my life, uh, newly saved, I really enjoyed the preaching. And we had some fire preachers. I mean, from Pastor Glenn and every guest that came, and even the staff pastors at the time, it was like they, these guys could really preach the paint off the walls. I mean, these guys were good. And as I told you before, I always thought that the worship was the time where we just kind of waited for late people to come to church. Right? We, the worship was just long because people were late, especially in our community because we're not but Latinos, you know, and we, we call it CPT. It's color people time. It's our time. It's, I, I'm going to come when I need to come. I'm going to be there. It's going to be on time, but not your time. And so that's what I thought. And so we go up to this crest and we drive an hour and a half up into the mountains and we're up there in the hills and, and I'm excited because I heard the lineup that they have and all the preachers that they have is phenomenal. Like, the lineup is just amazing. And I was just so excited to hear these guys speak. Seven o'clock, worship starts, and it was not like this, if I'm being honest. It was horrible. Like, I think they sang out of key. I think they were singing in the key of Z. The drum was so loud, like I could feel it in my teeth. The guitar is probably out of tune, and I'm a guitar player. They, they were making a joyful noise. They were making a joyful noise. So I suffered through this set of worship for an hour. And I thought to myself, surely he's going to get up and start speaking. Another hour goes by. I'm two hours in to this worship set. It's like eight, nine o'clock now. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like for real, like this is what we're doing? Another hour goes by. Can you feel the pain that I'm going through? Because at some point I started thinking of the Little Mermaid and the seagull that was singing, love. Because now the voices of every one of these singers is all raspy. I'm not there sound like Barry White. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's getting worse by the minute. Audibly. And I'm like, okay, God, this is, this is insane. What are they doing? Like, somebody needs to put a stop to this. And all of a sudden, the pastor gets up there and he opens up the Bible. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, I'm ready. I am so ready to hear him preach. And he opens it up and he's like, we need to worship. <laughs> Seriously? Four hours wasn't enough? No, we need to worship. And in that moment, I remember getting past my bitter self. And I said, okay, apparently God is trying to speak to me. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm just... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like they said. I'm just going to press in. And I remember I started singing just like them. And all of a sudden, in my heart and in my head, it went from a dead seagull to almost angelical voices. Like heaven opened up in that room. And I remember falling down to my knees and experiencing God in a way that I had never experienced him before. An hour later, I'm still wanting to worship. 
It's now 12 o'clock at night. They're kicking us out of the big room. So what did we do? We went and took over the amphitheater. You remember that? We took over the amphitheater. We saw demons flying out of people. We saw people getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. We saw God move in a way that I'd never seen God move before. And every year after that, when I went up there, that spot where I was bitter about the worship became an altar. Because I can point to that spot and say, that is when God touched me. My point to this whole thing of why I'm sharing even this story is that that is when God breathed the breath of life into me when I first experienced this thing called Holy Spirit. In the Greek, Holy Spirit is pneuma. It means Holy Spirit. I know that was, that was deep. The definition, though, is it's the third person of the triunion God. The Holy Spirit is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. They're not separated. Sometimes it's referred to in a way in which it emphasizes his personality or his character. The Holy Spirit, meaning it's set apart. It's not something that you and I have naturally. Sometimes it's referred to in a way in which it emphasizes his work and his power. The spirit of truth. Not your truth, not my truth, not the truth that the world's trying to get you to buy into, but the truth. I love what one theologian said. He said it this way. He said that the work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. The Holy Spirit is for you and I to actually be the church outside of church. It's real easy to be a Christian here on Sunday. It's real easy to love Jesus and love your neighbor in church on Sunday. Monday is a different story. I don't know if I'm preaching to the right crowd or not, but just because I have reverend in front of my name doesn't change that I'm still human. A brother got some issues. I know you don't have issues, and, you know, for some of you who are struggling, can you just wave quietly to me real quick and let me know that I'm not in the room alone? I, I appreciate that. For all of you ministering angels that are here today, that have joined us from heaven, and have accomplished so much more works than I, Pastor Chuck, Pastor Joey, thank you for being here with us. I am aspiring to be more and more like you. For the rest of us, though, am I alone when I'm still having to try to work stuff out? Am I alone where, where, where I feel like there are times where I still get angry and sin, and I'm trying not to sin while I'm angry? Am I alone when I say that, you know, it's hard sometimes to turn the other cheek, both naturally and physically? Because I, I can do prison ministry. I don't want to. I could. But I don't know if I'd have the same response as Pastor Joey or Pastor Chuck in this day and age of my walk. I'm trying. I'm really trying. And for those of you who can't say amen because I'm stepping on your foot, we'll get here in a minute. Listen, I'm not saying that you need to put in your time or you got to earn your stripes. That's not what I'm saying at all. I don't, think that that's, I don't think that's it at all. I think all of us have fallen short. All of us in this room have in some way, shape, or form missed the higher calling of God. We are, we are not perfect in Christ yet. Amen? Okay, just making sure we're in the right place because y'all might be angels and I'm just preaching to the choir. And so, What I am saying is that in spite of our shortcomings... It is important that you and I, no matter what we're dealing with, get up and walk. I don't care what you're dealing with, what you're going through, you are still a witness to Christ. You still have the Holy Spirit who is available to you and wants to work through you. We can't sit on the sideline of faith anymore. It's time for us to pull up our bootstraps and get into the fight. Not against your neighbor, not against your boss, not against your kids, not against your spouse, but it's really a fight of faith. Because the world is putting things in front of our eyes that are completely contrary to the word of God. And if we're not careful, 
you will start to blend and look like the world when God has called you out and higher. I came here today as a messenger to tell you God is still good. In spite of what you're going through, God is still good. I came here to tell you that he is still on the throne. I don't know who you thought got on the throne. I don't know who you think got in there and started moving things around in your life. He is still on the throne. I came here today to tell you that he still has a good plan for your life. It's plans to prosper you, plans to bless you, plans to bring you in and not beat you out. I came here to tell you that when you pray, he'll listen. I came here to tell you that God is still answering you even when you can't hear him. I've got a story that needs to be told and so do you. And it's time for us to get up and walk. I can't be lame with the life problems that I have anymore. I can't be lame with what life has thrown at me and just sit down in it and say, well, this is just my lot in life. I need to get up and walk. There has to be something different about us that people can point to and say, yeah, they're, they're different. Not in a weird kind of way, because some of you are really different. But <laughs> they're different. The elevator's not reaching the top. <laughs> Not that kind of different. I mean a different that like in spite of what's going on in the world, you still have peace. In spite of what's happening, you still have joy. I I'm talking about a different that like, you know, when, when, when people do something to you, a different kind of fruit is seen. Because that's the Bible's version of it. It says, you know, does our fruit, can we be honest? Does our fruit have the results of the spirit or the results of this world. Because Galatians 5, and 23 says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. I don't know what kind of fruit you see. I don't know what kind of fruit you've tasted. I don't know what kind of fruit you've had or what kind of fruits and nuts you've had to deal with in the kingdom. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit and that's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, verse 23, gentleness, and self-control. And as I've always said in the Greek, that literally means control yourself. God is not going to put strings on you and make you a puppet. God wants you to control yourself. I know you want to control your boss. I know you want to control your kids. I know you want to control your spouse. But God is saying control. Control. I'm a full-time, 24-7 hot mess. And I got to control myself. We live in a day and age where hate is more prevalent than love. We live in a day and age where despair is in the world more than joy. Distress is all over the news and there's no commentary of peace. People are mean. They're not kind. And don't even get me started with these movies today. I got so angry in the first service, I almost said something I shouldn't have. But we went to the movies this week, and literally out of the five or 15 previews that we had to see, because that's how they get you, you know, like the movie starts at like 3.20, but really like five hours later, you know, you're <laughs> sitting through all these previews, and now I want Coke for all of a sudden. I don't know why. There was three previews where I literally wanted to go to Hollywood and flip over tables. It is so wicked and so demonic. What they're producing right now is so evil. And we wonder why our kids are doing what they're doing. We wonder why there's school shootings. We wonder why people have gender identity issues. We wonder why families are being torn apart, why people just want to do whatever they want to do and live however they want to live with no control. We're feeding it to them out of a bottle, and the world is just eating it up. There's no goodness. Today, being unfaithful is acceptable. Well, you know, it just didn't work out with me and your mom. It's almost as though faithfulness is antiquated. It's old school. 
and brutality over gentleness or greatness. Uh, yeah, gentleness, I mean. And if you haven't noticed, as I said before, there's like zero self-control now. Like, we can't even have a conversation about my opinion. I can't have a different view than you because one of us is wrong. Because your truth has to be my truth. And if it's not your truth or my truth, then I'm objecting you in a way that's harmful to you. It never used to be that way. It never used to be that way. And most people, I'm not trying to get you down because it's already here, folks. I mean, if you, if you got your head in the sand, it's time to get your head out of the sand and look around because it's, it's here. There's no denying what I'm saying, but it gives me hope. I know that may sound kind of weird to you, but it gives me hope. Here's why it gives me hope. Because in the darkest of light, you don't even have to be that bright. The darker it gets, what little light you have is going to be a spotlight and a beacon to a hurting world. So you don't need a theological degree or to go to seminary for 16 years. All you need to do is tell your story. All you need to do is testify what God did in your life to a dying and hurting world and watch what will happen. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are active, it's another indication of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church. You and I need to bring the presence of God everywhere we go. You and I need to bring the presence of God everywhere we, need, we go, and we need to act, be active in the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Why? Why is it so important? Because it's the only way that the world will see and recognize the power of God. Can God come down and wipe it all clean? Yes, he can. But you know how he wants to do it? He wants to do it like a tidal wave. He wants to slowly move through you until there's such an enormous force that you and I are wiping out the works of the enemy together in unity, in one accord. Which leads me to my second point. Dunamis, power. It's where we get the word dynamite. In the Greek, it's pronounced dunamis. It means strength, power, and ability. Specifically, it means the power for performing miracles. It's moral power, power and excellence of soul. It's the power to influence, which belongs to riches and wealth. Here's my favorite version of it, though. It's the power that is consisting of or resting upon armies, forces, and hosts. There is a power that can operate in you and I that will literally push back the gates of hell. And I don't know how beat up we've been as a church. I don't know how, how condemned you've been made to feel or how lost you feel like you are or how imperfect you think that you are. Thank God it's not you. Thank God it's the power of God in us that can move on behalf of the Holy Spirit and let God do the great works that he wants us to do in this world today. That's the power that we need. When the Holy Spirit is active in our life, we can actually do what Jesus said in John 14, 12. I don't have it on the screens, but this is in a nutshell what he said. Greater works shall you do. You're going to do more than I did. That's what he said. And I'm sure the disciples were like, what? I'm sure they had to get a towel, wipe their forehead, and say, what? How am I going to do more than you? I love how Pastor Glenn explained it. There was only one Jesus in the bodily form. But that's not the end of what Jesus said. He said, you're going to be able to do great works, greater than me. How? Because I'm going to the Father. Thank God he went to the Father. Because now his spirit can rest on each and every one of us. Now you and I can do the works that Jesus did. I want to help you today to understand you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be perfect enough. You're never going to be saved enough. You're never going to ch attend church enough. You're never going to have the deeds enough. But it's not about you. It's about the power of God working in you. 
It's not about you. It's opening up and saying, God, use me. Jesus gave this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit. It's no longer trapped in one body. Now he gets to expand and come inside of you and me. Because Jesus ascended into heaven. Now we get to manifest the presence of God by defeating the works of the enemy. You see, the Holy Spirit empowers people to overcome. Overcome what? Spiritual opposition first and foremost to the preaching of the gospel. Let me help you understand this. If you think what I'm doing is preaching the gospel, you are wrong. I am not preaching the gospel right now. What I'm doing is standing up here sweating and trying to encourage you to be a better Christian. That's not preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel is your life. Your life should preach the gospel. Your business dealings and how you do your business dealings should preach the gospel. Your marriage should your work ethic should. Your friendships should. How you overcome adversity should. How you forgive people in spite of how they hurt you should. Tell your neighbor to say this. Say this to your neighbor. Let's overcome and let's preach the gospel. Let's overcome and let's preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit empowers people to overcome things of the world. I would love to be in heaven right now. It would be awesome. Amazing. No more worries, no more stress, no more pain, no more tears. Just living in the sweet by and by. Doing what? I have no idea, but it sounds so fun. <laughs> Golfing 24-7, I don't know. Fishing whenever I want. And the fish are always as big as you say they were. But we're not there yet. God has given us the power to witness about Jesus. Why is that important? Because it's not preaching the gospel from a microphone and an amplifying sound. It's how you live your life. To a dying world that says something's different. I want what you have. I don't care if you're shy. You have the power to share the good news just how you're created. God has equipped you with everything that you need to preach the gospel. We have the power to live for Jesus. Let me wreck some theology or some upbringing that you may have. You ready? Your mother and father were convenient to your destiny, but not necessary for your destiny. Therefore, you are not limited by who they are, what they did, or what they didn't do. You and I are new creations in Christ. I don't care how good your mama was or how good your grandmama was or how bad your daddy was. He was never there. I didn't get hugged enough as a child. I, I was abused. I don't care about any of that. I'm not negating it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. But at some point in time in life, you're going to have to overcome that and step into the higher calling of God. At some point in time in your life, you're going to have to overcome that and walk out your faith. At some point in time in your life, you're going to have to overcome that and be who God created you to be. In spite of your upbringing, in spite of how bad it was, in spite of the pain, in spite of the misery, in spite of what they didn't do or did do, you can overcome by the power that's in you. the power to trust again despite the betrayal. You have the power to forgive in spite of never hearing I'm sorry. You have the power of death to life to bring unity to chaos. You have power. It's untapped. It's a well that's so deep. It's a deep, deep well. It's inexhaustible. When you allow God to work through you, you're going to get tired, but you'll never run out. I thank God that we're not a weak church that bows and bends to the patterns of this world. 
We are a strong church that will witness to a dying and hurting world, which is my third point. We're called to be witnesses. A martyr. Let me tell you what witness means in the legal sense. It means this. That you have physically and spiritually seen something that no one can tell you any different. In a historical sense, in a legal sense, or a spectator of anything, and especially in an ethical issue, you know right from wrong. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. As a martyr, it means that you die a violent death for the cause of Christ. And I know some of you are thinking of what the disciples had to do. Some of them were boiled in oil, hung upside down on a cross, beheaded. You know what the worst death is? The death of your flesh. Because you have to kill that. You have to cut that head off. You have to be the one that says, I'm dying to what I want, and I'm going to live for what he wants. And that's a choice that only you can make. And believe me, I don't know if you've ever experienced having to not want to smack somebody in the face after they did something wrong, but that is a very hard task when all you've known your whole life is how to fight with your fist. When you want to give in to that temptation, because it worked for you before, and now you got to fight that and say, no, i got to kill that in my life? Boy, that's a hard, violent death. And I want to kill that flesh man every single day. I would love to tell you that it gets easier. I would love to tell you that the more that you walk with God, it seems a little bit easier, but it's not. It gets hard out in them streets. It gets hard sometimes when you want to do what you want to do and not do what Christ wants to do or what the anointing tells you to do. And you got to carry your cross daily, not weekly when you come into church on Sunday, daily. Tomorrow, you're going to have to kill your flesh. Tuesday, you're going to have to kill your flesh. Every single day of the week, you and I are going to have to kill and crucify our flesh and carry our cross and be the witness to what Jesus is doing in our life. And for whoever thinks that that's a weak-minded people, they've never tried it. Because being a Christian requires some girth. It requires some grit. It requires some strength that you didn't know that you had. Some peace that you didn't know where you were going to get it from. It is not easy. But it's worth it. Every day it's worth it. Every moment it's worth it. I promise you it's worth it. It's worth it. So what have you experienced God do? Now some of us in here have been saved for a long time. I don't know about you, but, you know, I... I got saved often, <laughs> often. Like my first few years coming to this church, like, I was like, altar call's coming. I'm going to be the first. I was ready a hundred times easily, easily. I'm probably low, lowballing the number. I come running to this altar easily every single week. Got to get saved again. Got to get right with Jesus again. This week was a doozy. I'm not even going to tell you how many people I cussed out and flipped off as I was driving to work. Jesus, I'm sorry. Monday morning was rough. And there was five other days that followed that. And here we are. And I wasn't a good witness. Well, I came up to this altar often. Often trying to get right. And then I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that it was easier, but something switched in my mind. Something switched in my spirit. See, before I was coming to the altar every single week because guilt, shame, and condemnation drew me to the altar. When I got the Holy Spirit, I learned that I had the power to so stop being a repeat offender. Let me say that again. When I got the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, I learned how to not be a repeat offender. I still had struggles. I still wanted to do some things. And, you know, even though I didn't say it, I thought it. I'll be honest. 
I may not have cussed him out verbally, but in my head, whoo! <laughs> Lord have mercy. It was a refining process. He had to work on me. And I would love to tell you that I still have it together now, but there are moments. Can I get a witness? There are moments. Well, I don't always have the right response. But here's what I've learned. It's not a matter of my eternal salvation at this point. It's a matter of my witness. Am I better today witnessing for Jesus in the life that I live, just the normal 24-7 hot mess that I am? Am I better today as a witness for Jesus than I was yesterday? I'm only competing against myself. Because before I would come down to the altar and I would see all these people up here and I'd be like, man, they got it all together. And you know, only church, church has the best bondo. Church, church folks have the best bondo, the best prime shine. I mean, church folk like no other, you can get banged up, battered up, abused, and come in looking like a fresh Ferrari. Hair did, nails did, fresh fade, cool fit, bondo. Bondo. Because underneath all that bondo is a wreck. But thank God Jesus put some bondo on you and painted you up and fixed you up a little bit that in spite of all the mess and in spite of all the wreck, you still look good, you still run good, you still work good. Thank God for the bondo of Jesus. I remember when Jesus came into my life. I remember when Jesus told me to get up and walk. So when did Jesus come for you? So I remember how I changed, but I wasn't perfect. I remember how I was still struggling with things. But he picked me up and he turned me around and he put my feet on solid ground. See, we need to stop acting like we've waited for Jesus to come back 2,000 years. I mean, some of us are like, oh, Lord, when is he going to come back? It's just bad. You've been saved three months. It ain't even close to being bad for you yet. Some of us have been saved a hundred years and you still like, oh. it's nothing compared to eternity. I mean, honestly, the worst we have it is what, 70, 80, 90 years here on earth? And then we're with him? I think it's time for us to pull up our bootstraps and get into the fight. And stop asking for Jesus to come and start showing up and showing out with the Holy Spirit in you. When did Jesus come for you? Maybe it's today. Maybe it was 30 years ago. When did you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, maybe that's today. Or maybe it was 30 some odd years ago. Either way, here's what I know. We need to stop asking when Jesus is going to come back and start asking ourselves, when are we going to show up with him? I'm going to try over here. I got no love over there. When are you going to show up with him? Don't, don't ask for him to come back. He's in you. When, when are you going to show up with him? You don't even have to be that bright. If the elevator doesn't reach the top floor, that's just how he made you. Use and work what you got, baby. Show up with Jesus. God has been good to you. Has God healed you? Has God turned things around? Did you forget that it's in him that you live and you move and you breathe? Family, come on now, come on. You know, God still has a good plan for your life. A real good plan for your life. A plan for good, a plan. Read Jeremiah 29, 11 if you have to. Plans to prosper you. We need to get our head out of the clouds and stop listening for the trumpets of heaven and get into the work of depopulating hell. 
Which leads me back to, as I close, Acts chapter 3. Hear it again. I don't have any silver and gold for you. But I'll give you what I have. You're not going to have what the world wants. You may be thinking, well, I'm not qualified. I don't have the experience. That's not what they're looking for. They don't know what they need. You're applying for a job, and you're thinking to yourself, I am so not qualified for this. But somehow, your resume went to the top. Because God is strategically placing you in a place where he needs to work. So you are more than qualified to do the work that God has for you to do. It's just time that you show up with him. Let me keep reading because here's what it says. In the name of Jesus Christ. It's not in the name of Rich Villafana. It's not in your name or your surname or whatever name you have. Because it's not about you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Get up and walk. Stand to your feet. I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to get out of your hair right now. I'm done. I'm done. I got two altar calls. Two. Say two. One of them is going to be super uncomfortable, but that's okay. You know, over the years, I just kind of figured we're going to do this. I'm going to do this this way because the Bible says that if you're ashamed of me in front of man, then I'll be ashamed of you in front of the Father. And so, you know, I could to help you have you bow your head and close your eyes and pull on the harp strings of your heart. But some of you are sitting in here today and you know that if you walked out of here and got hit by a bus or you were died tonight, there's a question in your head. I don't know if I'm going to heaven or if I'm going to hell. I don't know if I'm going to be with Jesus or I'm going to be eternally separated. And it's not the flames that scare me. It's not the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that scare me. You know what scares me about hell? Is the eternal separation from never being able to say, God help me. Because sometimes the deepest prayer you can pray is, God help me. Even when you're shaking your fist, looking at your kid, God help me. But to never be able to do that? That's scary. Because in my darkest moment, I can still reach out to heaven. I can still call upon my Father. And I know that He's listening to me. But to never be able to do that? That scares me. So if you're in here today, and you don't know what would happen if you were to pass into eternity, just wave your hand. I don't care if you've been saved before, or this is your first time, just wave it to me. Wave it to me. I can't see past the lights. You gotta, I see you over here. I see you over here. Hey, celebrate with them, church. Don't act like you didn't have to do this once before, too. Wave at me. Come on, keep waving at me. Over here, over here, wave at me. You died today, you would not know where you're going. This is your salvation call. Now, you waved your hand, come up here, right here. I want you to come up. Altar team, come up right now too. But if you waved your hand, you waved your hand back there, come here. Come up here. I want you to be right here, right in front of Mary, right here. These are your new brothers and sisters. Start welcoming them, church. Start welcoming them, church. This is not a moment to be embarrassed. This is a freeing moment. Right here in front, right here, right here. Get him down here. Get him down here. Get him over here. You have no idea where you're going to spend eternity. You're going to know today. Come on. Keep coming. Don't be shy. And I don't care how old she is or how young she is or how old he is or how young he is. Say, excuse me. They'll move. Come on, church. Give it up for them. Look at They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Just tell them I got to get up and walk. I got to get up and walk. Excuse me. I got to get up and walk. Okay, 
Bear with me because I got to talk to your knucklehead brothers and sisters real quick, okay? Okay, bear with me. We're gonna, I'm going to come down here and we're going to pray personally with you. I want to touch and hug every single one of you. Thank God you came up here. Beautiful moment for you. Beautiful moment. Second altar call this. I don't know how long it's been since you've seen God move in your life. And maybe you're just going through the motions. You see other people be used by God. You keep saying to yourself, someday, someday God will. Church, you don't have someday. All you have is today. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Faith is now the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of it. It is now. Let me teach you something about eternity. You know what eternity is? Eternity is now. Because if you were to take your phone out and take a picture, when time you looked at it, it'd be then. All you have is right now. Tomorrow is not promised. You could walk out of here today and it would be your last day. I want to live for today. I want God to use me today. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be crazy. I want the life that I live to exemplify and show Christ to the world. So if that's you, wave at me. Wave at me. I'm not going to have you come down here. Just wave at me. You want deeper connection with God? You want God to use you in a deeper way? Wave at me. Okay, God, you see all their hands. You see all their hands. What you're saying right now is, here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. Just say that now. God, God, here I am. Use me. Send me. Let me be a witness for you. Father, I pray for each and every one of these people that have their hands raised, that want to go deeper with you, that want to connect with you in a deeper way, that want to be used by you in a deeper way, God. I pray that you would fill them again with your spirit. Fill them for the first time. It's their first time right now. Fill them with your presence and your spirit. And let them do great exploits for you. And I thank you for this in Jesus' mighty, matchless name. Pastor Joey, can you come up here? I need to get down here with my little brothers and my new sisters.